you uh, for coming tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I really, really am supportive of these initiatives. Um, just the mixture of different people in the room for me is really, really stimulating. So I hope to learn as much from you as hopefully you can learn from me. Um, William Beer, I'm actually Canadian, um, but I've spent most of my career in Europe. I worked for many years in Italy, in France, in the UK, and more recently spent a couple of years down in Brazil. I initiated and started my career many years ago in an Italian company called Olivetti as a technical writer working with uh, the system engineers who were designing complex Unix systems. Then I moved to NCR, which was bought out by AT&T. Then I moved to... Um, uh, IBM. We, I was actually initially at Lotus, which was bought out by IBM. Spent a couple of years in a content management company called Vignette, which was really interesting, um, doing some large complex development projects. And then was in Symantec for about five years before moving into PwC, um, where my recent focus has been much more around the security strategy and governance aspects. I've got a technical background. I'm really passionate about technology. But now my focus is making sure that clients have the right organization to protect their businesses, the right strategy, and even more importantly, spending the right, of money, right amount of money on the right things. Great. So, um, so what's your uh, bread and butter today? What is it that you do actually on a day-to-day basis? So in, in, in the company I work for, I work for a management consultancy based here in New York called Alvaris and Marsal. We're a billion-dollar management consultancy. And the way I like to describe it is we help clients with tough problems. The way the other day a colleague uh, described it in front of a client was we like to run into burning buildings. Now, I'm not sure I want to run into a burning building, but I've got lots of colleagues who do that. So they're really good at helping clients primarily after a breach. So we come in and we fix it up, fix it up we tidy up the mess. But my focus to respond more specifically to your question, it's much more around getting the right strategy in place, as I said earlier, making sure the right governance is in place. What I'm seeing at a lot of my clients is that they're really, really struggling. They're all in firefighting mode, and they're struggling to take a more proactive stance with regards to security, and that's where we're helping through a whole series of different types of services that we offer. Great, and I think that the what we touch upon today would be some of the experience you've had um, and maybe some of the uh, comments you have from, from uh, working with such large organizations. So um, in our prior discussion we had prior to this, this meetup, um, we talked a bit about the risk-based frameworks um, and what they mean uh, to the organization, how they follow them, and what are the caveats of, of uh, using those frameworks, if you don't mind expanding. Yeah, and that's a, that's a big question. Um, obviously, uh, here in the United States, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of focus now on the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is great. Um, I think that frameworks um, are fantastic because they help establish a common language, which is really useful to making sure you get executive buy-in, and that's a really positive thing about frameworks. Um, obviously, there's different frameworks that are used in different parts of the world. So back in Europe, uh, most of the focus is still on the ISO 27001 framework. But I would say that there's one thing that really concerns me. Um, if everyone starts to herd, right, everyone starts to run towards a specific framework, it does suck out a fair amount of creativity and innovation in the industry. Um, I remember a, a conference I was at a couple of years ago in London where some of the forefathers of BS7799 were speaking, um, which eventually became ISO 27001 Family Series, and they actually said, look, we made a mistake. Um, we shouldn't have pushed so hard these frameworks because they're forcing organizations to become really rigid, really structured. And if you think about the organized criminals, that's not the way they are organized. And so while I, I do think, and one of the biggest projects I'm working on right now is a NIST CSF uh, a CSF project. While I do definitely see the value, I think you need to take them with a grain of salt, and you shouldn't allow your security function to be completely governed by the framework, but pick and choose the best aspects from it. And there's lots of different frameworks and different approaches. I mean, maybe just to touch on a little bit what we're doing for one of my clients right now, which is a large oil and gas company. What we're doing for this specific organization is we're doing a global gap analysis against NIST CSF. And we're providing them with a maturity rating, so giving them a clear indication of how they stack up against NIST, and then providing them with a remediation plan. But something else that we're doing for this specific client, which I think is really interesting, um, is we're using another uh, framework, which is called the Standard of Good Practice, which isn't very well known here in the United States. It was designed many years ago, I think about 25 years ago, by a nonprofit organization called the Information Security Forum. And the beauty of the standard of good practice is, one, that it's mapped to NIST, 
So if I'm using NIST, I can map it against the ISF standard of good practice. But then the standard of good practice contains a deep and broad library, not just of technical controls, but organizational and governance controls that I can then use to help accelerate and, and move, my, move my organization along in this journey. Uh, I think it's important to say that you know, when you do look at implementing a framework, it is a journey. It's not something that you do once and then it's finished. It's a, it's a process. Um, and so I think that that, that, that that approach that we're using at this specific client of mapping to the standard of good practice is very powerful because it gives us access to that library of controls. Great. Uh, how do you judge these frameworks in terms of the, them being useful to a specific client? Wow, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, one of the things that I see that's driving um, or drove, at least in the past, a lot of um, focus and interest in some of the frameworks was actually for commercial reasons. Um, a lot of people said, look, I'm getting so much pressure from some of the organizations that I deal with to demonstrate to them that I am serious and focused on security that I now need to become, for example, ISO 27001 certified. So it really depends from client to client. But I think based on my past experience, something that I saw as a very important trigger, including at one of the organizations I worked with, was that the framework itself was used as a, yes, public certification process to demonstrate to the clients and the organizations that we were dealing with, that we were taking their data uh, seriously, and we were doing our best to protect it. Um, now, it's not a really tricky question, but uh, what are your favorite NIST or auto government standards that you uh, like or work with right now, and why? Well, that, that's, that's tough again. Um, I, I think when we talk about security, I think we need to be really careful that we don't get caught up in national solutions. And I was saying this to some of the people uh, during the beer and pizza. Um, cybersecurity is really a global problem. And while I think that you know the NIST CSF framework is fantastic and we're involved with it and we support it and we use it, I think it's important to look globally when you're considering whatever type of solution you're designing for your client with regards to cyber. And one of the things, as I mentioned before, that I think is, is really powerful is the standard of good practice. It's been around for, I think, about 25 years, very deep, developed by a nonprofit organization. I was speaking to a client just a couple of weeks ago out in Germany, a large bank, and um, someone had suggested to them that we use NIST CSF, and the client pushed back, and they said, no, that's a U.S. framework. We're a German bank, and we don't want to use it. And you know, uh, while I may not totally agree with that decision, because I do think this is good, I do understand their position. So I think it's important that we put on a global thinking cap when we try and decide which, which framework or which approach is best for our client. So uh, switching to uh, other exciting topic, um, let's talk a bit about security intelligence and external collaboration. Right? How is it done today? Uh, what you've seen from large enterprise and how they do it? Uh, what are the caveats of, of sharing that type of information? Um, and how is it actually done? I don't think a lot of people know how that collaboration is actually uh, happens in real life. Yeah, another interesting question and a tough one. I, I, I think that still, and it once again varies from geography to geography, and I'm in a, in a bit of a learner's curve here in the United States, so I'm still in observer mode. But what I've seen based on my experience in working with clients is that um, there's still an incredible amount of informal sharing amongst the security community. And I actually think that's a good thing, right? I, I pick up the phone or I contact my buddy who I know and I trust and I share something with him or her and I get their feedback. That is fine. The problem with that is it doesn't scale. And if something really bad happens, that's not going to help us. I think the work that's done by the ISAC, so for example, the FS ISAC are, is fantastic. Um, my firm is a member. Um, I've actually done some projects for them, and I think very highly of them. They obviously have a more rigid platform and a process in place to share information. But what else I think is really interesting is not just the technical in information that's being shared, because obviously we've got threat intelligence providers who are doing a, a big, big business right now, and I, I'm very supportive of threat intelligence. But generally speaking, that's still ad addressing technical vulnerabilities. What I've also seen to be really powerful and interesting is organizations or opportunities to share information among executives. And there, the information that may be shared at the executive level is going to be different. So just to give you an example, I was running a regular dinner for a group of executives from big banks back in London. And it was very successful, and there was always lots of good food and lots of good wine and good dialogue and lots of sharing. But one day, a very senior executive from one of the world's biggest banks said to me, William, love the dinners, love the sharing, but we want to shake it up. We need to have people from retail, pharmaceutical, other organizations here because the problem's so bad now that 
I don't want to speak only to my sector clients. Now, I know the ISACs have now created the ISAC Council to share amongst themselves, which is great, but I think we, once again, need to think about global cross-pollination if we're really going to share the right information at the right time. Not to be done easily, right? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I remember in a closed-door forum, an organization said, and they said, you know, the door's closed. Why would I share information about threat with my competitors if I've invested millions of dollars and well prepared? That gives me a competitive advantage. You know, that's obviously a heated, heated topic for debate. I tend to think you need to think about the common good. Um, I think part of the problem now is a lot of the threat information has actually become a big business because there's bounties involved. And so it's, it's actually become more complicated than that because some individuals say, hey, I've got some information about a potential vulnerability. Am I going to share it? Maybe not because I can make some money off of it. I think that more work definitely needs to be done around building structures, building organizations that share in a more structured fashion. It's kind of segue to the next question. What are the roadblocks? to improve collaboration among industry, government, and law enforcement. Uh, that's typically uh, what we've seen is that um, a lot of organizations talk about collaboration, but in, in real life, uh, you know, it's not easily done. Yeah, I, I, I was involved in some of the UK government's initiatives around that very topic. And I think part of the challenge is that you need to think about what motivates people, right? Why would I share something? And, and I think that private sector is very different from public sector, and that's fine. And I think you need to think about how that gap can be bridged before you actually even begin to think about sharing the information. So if you can think about you know, what is going to motivate a government employee to share information with the private sector, and what's going to motivate a private sector employee to share information with the government, if you can get that right and create an infrastructure that helps and facilitates that, I'm optimistic. I think you need to be optimistic to be in security. And I think that people will eventually do the right thing. But you need to give the platform and you need to make sure that, that you understand some of their limitations and some of their own motivations. Great. Uh, so we're kind of switching topic a little bit again. Uh, in this particular case, because your, your role into running into burning buildings, um, often you have access no to... Hair, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, same here. I actually don't run into buildings and I still don't have a hair. Um, but... Um, you have access to some very high senior level executives that don't necessarily understand cybersecurity. Uh, so the question is, you know, how do um, these executives actually uh, treat and take the information uh, security um, as a whole? You know, what, what is the approach and how do you, uh, you know, explain the risks associated with some of these uh, issues? Right. So it's, it's definitely evolving and it, it's, it's, I think it's also very different from sector to sector and geography to geography and possibly even... I might even say from state to state, state based on what I've seen. But what I would say is that most senior executives are now aware of the, the threats from cyber. They see it in the Wall Street Journal on a, almost on a daily basis, which is great. I think that most of them are hungry for more information. They're probing. They want to be enabled to ask the right questions. And something that I've found that works really well when engaging with senior, senior management is either give them specific data points, you know, very short bullet points. Bullet points are great. Um, if I can provide them with numbers, that's fantastic. But the other thing that's really good that I think helps them is give them probing questions. So, for example, a, a probing question that I gave to a CFO the other day was, if we were to suffer a data breach, would we be able to look our regulators and our stakeholders in the eyes and tell them we had done everything that, we, that was reasonably possible? That's a tough question. And he said, oh, I love it. And he wrote it down on a sticker note, and he was happy. Now, hopefully, eventually, we'll get some work from him. But I think that what they need is probing questions. So if you can enable them with probing questions, then I think part of the journey is, is, is taking place. And uh, have you seen any changes in terms of how um, executives treat uh, cybersecurity and how the entire organization culture? We talked about a lot about the culture of organization and how that affects the, the ability of the organization to actually uh, deal with cybersecurity as a whole. Uh, so that's kind of a two-part question. First, have you seen a change happening in that? And, and secondly, how important is the culture effect uh, within the organization to, to, treat, uh, to treat incidents in cybersecurity? So first part, definitely seen a change. Um, <clears throat> I've been in this space for quite some time. It was always an uphill battle. And I now kind of smile and think, goodness, now we do get access to the senior executives. We do even get access to the board. I remember um, about a year ago presenting to a board of directors. And with all due respect to them, very intelligent men and women, but the average age in the room was probably 75 plus. 
and I, as I gave my session and presented to them, I actually thought four or five of them were sleeping, but they weren't. They were just pacing themselves. And at the end of the session, they asked some really, really tough questions that I struggled with. So I think that there's definitely recognition at the senior most levels that things uh, need to change. And I think the other thing that you just touched on is really important, which is culture. Um, I've done quite a bit of work with uh, energy companies. And in energy companies, the overriding culture is about safety, right? Protecting people's lives. If you can understand what the corporate culture is and what that, is, uh, what that, what that represents, you can build off that to build really different, compelling security programs that really get people in the gut. But I think if you don't do that, if you just storm in with a standard framework, whatever it may be, and you don't think about the people aspects, you're going to fail. I mean, the, the head of um, security at the Bank of England, I think about six months ago, he announced that he was hiring a behavioral psychologist into his cyber team. And I thought, wow, that's good news. Because if you get a behavioral psychologist in your team and you understand what makes people tick, then obviously the solutions are going to be better. At least I think so. And, and what about um, you know, the throwing money at a problem? I mean, we've seen organizations that go out there and spend millions of dollars on, on hardware, software, accommodation thereof, um, without actually understanding uh, you know, the strategy to deploy them, manage them, and so on. I mean, what's your take on that? Is that, is that changing as well? Do people look into buying, uh, you know, software into um, different models of deployment, or is it still, you know, like the old days, let's fix the, this problem and move on to the next one? I honestly think we've still got a lot of work to do in that space. Uh, I, I was in uh, an organization two weeks ago, a uh, mid-sized uh, financial organization, and there were boxes everywhere in, in, in the CISO's office of unopened hardware and software. And the, the comment was, we just don't have time to open them. And I thought, you know, I'm sure you could be prioritizing differently and spending your money better on, on the right things. And I think that, once again, it's important that you involve a wider group of experts when you look at security because there's a lot of technical people, like myself, looking at it. But if you can involve different people, business analysts, financial analysts, you can get a different take on it, which really helps you make sure you're spending the right money on the right things. And just to add to that, I think threat intelligence, looping back to what we were talking about earlier, threat intelligence is amazing, but most people are using threat intelligence only to indicate where there are threats. But if you give your threat intelligence information to a business analyst and say, hey, am I spending the right money based on the threats that are coming through this feed, or do I have the right people or the right training, then you can start to calibrate your program very, very differently, and that's powerful. So that's a great question. So how can you know if the source is, is a good source? Because sometimes it could potentially come from you know, the criminals or the bad guys. Um, I think it's really around working with a reputable organization, possibly cross-referencing that with another organization. So there's a lot of vendors out there, a lot of companies that are doing great work in the threat intelligence space. Maybe pick one of those and then cross-reference that with public open source information. That would probably be my suggestion. Um, but I, I take your point. There's a challenge and a threat there in itself. So we're going to uh, segue into another topic, um, the last one before we, we open up for, the, for questions. Um, so Michael Brown, the CEO of Symantec, um, mentioned that is the uh, workforce expected to rise to us. Uh, uh, you know, demand for workforce in the cybersecurity space expected to rise to 6 million uh, globally by 2019, projected shortfall of 1.5 million. Uh, and it's something we touch upon, the fact that you come into an organization where they don't have the, the manpower or the, the people power um, to station these positions. So what, what do you suggest for, for large enterprises looking to, to hire, looking to train, um, the strategy to fill those positions in the next uh, several years? Yeah, another great question. I don't think there's a, an easy solution here because it's going to take time. Um, but maybe a couple of examples. I was actually in an internal meeting um, just a couple of weeks ago down in Chicago, and there was a, a, a full capabilities of our consulting practice. And as I listened to some of my colleagues who are doing IT consulting projects talk about their projects, I thought, goodness, that's an incredible set of adjacent skills here that I could use on my cyber projects. So I think, first of all, it's around identifying adjacent skill sets, which is really powerful. But I think, with all due respect to the CEO of Symantec, I think we're casting our net 
too, in, in too narrow of a fashion. I think some of the more exciting projects that I've worked on in the past have involved people with a really different skill set. So for example, I've done work on cybersecurity projects with corporate strategy folk, with business analysts, with um, communications experts. All of those people have an incredible role to play in a cybersecurity solution. If we just go and look for people with you know, the capability to reverse engineer an APT, that's important. That's the core of it, yes. But we also need people with a broader skill set. And I think if we begin to do that, we'll pull people into our profession, which is good. The other thing that I've seen that's worked really well at some of the clients that I've been engaged at is things like um, job rotation. So let's bring people from the marketing team into the security function. Let's bring people from the finance function into the security function to create links and to create better understanding and create sponsors in the other part. And then the final piece is, Younger people. I mean, I am so um, supportive of younger people. They have a built-in, almost an innate sense of some of the threats that not necessarily us older people have. I was at a conference a couple of years ago, and some of the biggest and brightest brains from across the world were there. But probably one of the more insightful things that was said to me was by a 14-year-old boy. And he just said, I know when it's wrong. I can tell by the syntax, I can tell by the way they type, I can tell by the language that they use. And I thought, gosh, if we can take that built-in street sense, cyber street sense, and build that into some of our solutions, then we're accessing a broader skill base. Great, thank you. So maybe, um, I don't know if uh, anyone has any questions or discussions you'd like to, to raise, that'd be time now. Uh, okay, so I'll, um, yeah, maybe some, somebody here. Yeah. That's a great question. I think that most security organizations, I'm massive generalization, but most security organizations that I see are really struggling because they haven't evolved as the threats have evolved. And based on what we said earlier, some of the frameworks, they're very rigid. They're not always seen as supporting the business. Um, people often say, hey, those are the guys who always say, no, you know, I can't use my own device. I can't use that new product. I can't use that technology. And a lot of money is given to them, but we don't see any results. And so people kind of keep them you know, at, at a distance. And I think what you just touched on is really important. I think that the security organization of the future needs to be a bit more like Velcro, a Velcro organization that I can rip and tear apart and change as the threats change. And I would be very supportive of taking people from the security organization organization and putting them in other business units, maybe on a you know a three month, six month basis to help and support and then pull them back. I think that would be very beneficial. And I also think that um, just uh, I'm trained as an attorney and now I'm in the security industry and have a lot of business. A lot of security is, is mystified for some reason. It's it's elevated to this sort of platform and it's made to seem much more sort of confusing than it needs to be. Um, ultimately, what I find the biggest challenges are in security within an organization is that it's typically language and communication, uh, culture, and a lack thereof, and then either the business doesn't understand the security's purpose or security doesn't understand the business goals, and then there's just this huge gap between the two. But those aren't, I think hackers and, and you know threat actors are using that as to their benefit, but those aren't primarily security. So how do you engage, because I speak to CISOs all the time, how do you engage them and, and, and talk to them specifically about those areas where that's not where the training is? How do you provide that? Yeah. Th that's, that's a great question, and, and I, I don't have a, a simple answer, but I think it does come down to soft skills. Um, I think, generalization again, but I think that a lot of the people in the security industry come up through basically two backgrounds, IT or the military. Right? And those two backgrounds basically have a certain mindset, 
And generally speaking, our soft skills are not as good as they need to be. And so I would actually argue that any person who's involved in security really needs to think about things like presentation skills, negotiation skills, basic business and finance skills. If you can get three or four of those under your belt, I think you'll be a much more successful uh, security professional and you'll build the bridges that are needed. Any other questions? Yeah, got it yeah, right here. So a lot of talk about internal security. What are you seeing with your clients in regards to migrating to like managed services? Okay, great question. And I used to do quite a bit of managed security services when I was in Symantec. I'm very passionate and I think it's, it is part of the answer to the, the, the crisis that we're facing with regards to resources. I think that oftentimes managed security services, 24-7 monitoring of security devices and more, um, they work on a model which is focused on how many analysts can I get per quantity of devices which is quite rigid, and that doesn't always work well for the clients. I also think that a lot of clients have weak processes and haven't integrated the managed security services very well. Something I said to my client, a client of mine a couple of weeks ago in jest, but not completely, I said, go and pull the plug on one of your security devices. See if you get an alert from the security operations center. And if you don't, you pick up the phone and you ask for a meeting and you say, look, we need to do things differently in 2016. And I don't know yet if she got the call or got an alert, but I tend to think she won't. But I th I'm a great believer in managed security services, but I think you need to go through one, a managed security services readiness review to make sure that your structure, your processes are ready to use the SOC. And two, I think you need to have some very interesting and direct conversations with the security operations center around, can I use some of their added capacity in their SOC to help me with other things? Because oftentimes, at three o'clock in the morning, I won't say they're twiddling their thumbs, but they've got some extra cycles, and maybe that's something you can use to your advantage. So you take those two things and you combine them, and then I think managed security services tends to add a lot of value. Great question. We have time for one more, anybody? Wonderful question, and I, I struggle, okay? I really struggle. I'm sometimes criticized a little bit that some of my ideas are a little too blue sky. One of the projects I did a couple years ago, a year and a half ago, was for a large bank in Switzerland, and we had a fantastic team, very solid, traditional thinkers. We had senior executive buy-in from the client, and I was called in to kind of disrupt the thinking and kick the tires really hard on what was doing. It went really well, and, and, but it went well because they identified that as a requirement for the project from the get-go. I would say if that isn't the case, generalization, a lot of security professionals are reluctant to change. I think they're, they're, they're so focused on firefighting that they're really reluctant to exploring new ideas. And so I would say that without going over their heads, it's important to engage with the CFO. OGC, Office of General Counsel, even the CEO. Um, if you can engage with some of the business leaders without obviously, obviously jeopardizing the relationship with the CISO, I think you'll find them a little more open-minded, a little more flexible sometimes, and, and they will say, hey, let's try that idea. So that's been my approach to date. Not saying it's perfect or it works, but it seems to be getting us a little bit of traction. Fantastic. Thank you very much, William Beer. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.